Professor Pearl, take us back to your childhood. Where are you as a child? What is your family like? And my family came from Poland. My father came there in 1924 with a few um, families of pioneers, we call them today, and established a new town. And the town was? The town name is Bnei Brak, which is a biblical town, mm -hmm. which my grandfather thought it would be nice to reinvigorate. <laughs> it used to be a, a place of learning, according to the Mishnah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they did it. This they is the time of town, the British mandate. The British mandate. Uh, they had no problem coming in. Uh, no, because at that time the British were kind, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it was 20, 1924. It's before there was a um, conflict with the uh, Palestinian at that time. It started around that time in 1929, mm -hmm. and, but. Um, uh, I think it was a, almost a f free immigration from Poland. The family was committed to agriculture? What was well, the, my what was grandfather the was a merchant, oh. a textile merchant in, mm -hmm. in, in Poland. But when they came over to Bnei Brak, they had to work the land. They grew radishes. Mm -hmm. And when the radishes um, <laughs> became too um, cheap, um, they decided to do a dairy, mm -hmm. and they sent my grandfather to Damascus to buy the cows. Mm -hmm. And he had to learn to grow cows. <laughs> so your father was born there? My no. father, no. My father came, came 14 with, years old. Right, he was 14. 14. Um, by the time... You were born, just because we don't have so much time, uh, I, I need to get you born. So you were born in... I was born in 1936, right. And at this time, your father and mother are professionals? They are... Because and I just... The environment in your household... My father was working in a um, uh, citrus orchard. Huh? Then he shifted to... Um, he became a city secretary. Huh. Yeah, he changed profession. And so I, I was born to families that did not finish college. Okay. Even my mother, yeah, she was sort of, uh, she came from a cultural house, but not uh, academic. So I'm going to make you 10 years old. What do you like at 10 years old? Are you, are you interested in school? <coughs> are you have teachers? Are you surrounded by books? I'll tell you, I was a good student, but not brilliant. Mm -hmm. I was not among the first or second in class. I was third and fourth, mm -hmm. or fourth, yeah. I did answer the questions that they asked, and sometimes I asked them in an uh, innovative way. Mm -hmm. I remember that, but uh, nothing to be uh, proud of. As a matter of fact, I remember the clear day when the teacher wanted to meet my mother, and I thought, oh, here he goes again and complain about me. Does he even know me? <clears throat> I was surprised when she came back and said, yes, he knows you, and you're saying you're doing fine. Me, fine? <laughs> here you are. <laughs> Somebody knows, noticed me. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so you're early, you're not yet used to being a distinguished uh, intellectual. No, not at all. Are you getting, by the time of high school, a good education in your estimation? Well, that is the point which I never understood. I got the best education one can think of. Oh, tell us about it. That is, um, came to my mind when I, after getting my touring award, I happened mm -hmm. to sit by Bill Gates at uh, some meeting that he had with leading of uh, science educators. And he asked me, anything in your childhood that would, you would like to share with us that made you special or something? Mm -hmm. I said, no, nothing. And then I caught myself. By George, <laughs> I had, I was lucky to be part of the greatest educational experiment in mankind, in Whoa. history. Oh, I know it, but <laughs> But just think, I said, 
If the state of California forces every professor to spend five years teaching high school, oh. eh? uh, imagine the kind of education that high school kids will get. Now imagine further that they are doing it not because they are forced to, but because they, they see it as their mission. Yes. Okay. That would happen to me. Those are your kinds of teachers. My teacher came from Heidelberg. Really? Yeah, Heidelberg in Berlin, and uh, who knows, they, they were, you know, great scientists at the time wow. that were displaced by Hitler and had to leave Germany and came to Israel, and they couldn't find the academic job, so they taught high school. Oh, extraordinary. And we were their victims, actually, not victims. Yeah, no, of course, of course. They looked at us as replacement for their scientific dreams. Wow. Because they knew, you know, that we are going to establish a new state, a new society where science education is part of being excellent, uh, part of excellence. So you respond well to the teaching? Yeah, I responded well. Yeah, I, I did just system. well. I wasn't uh, shiny. No, but, but you were receiving. I was receiving constantly. Quite well, and uh, also a nice thing about them, they taught us in a um, historical manner, chronologically, not logically. Mm. So every theorem and every invention was connected with a scientist uh, face. So for us, science is not a collection of facts. It is a constant human struggle with the mysteries of nature. Right. Beautifully said. So yeah. you are deciding to become a scientist, or is it? Oh no, no, no. <laughs> I thought I'm going to go to humanities in the sixth grade of high school, and then I switched back to science. Luckily, uh, I don't think I would do very well in humanities, or maybe I would. But anyhow, uh, I my career was determined only I went after I went to the army. I went to the army team in a, it's called the Nachal Corps, which was partly agriculture, partly serving in the kibbutz and partly serving in the army. And I thought I'll become a member of a kibbutz all my life and I need to study agriculture, agro agronomy. And uh, that was my um, thinking mm -hmm. during my army service. But then, <clears throat> I, I guess I wised up. <laughs> or I asked people, uh, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little good in math, which profession should I go to utilize it? And they told me, go study engineering. So I did. I went to engineering. It was hard for me because it was considered a, a betrayal. Mm, to of, go and the study kibbutz ideal? the kibbutz ideal, yeah. I see. Uh, it was, uh, I remember the day when I told the, uh, the secretary of the kibbutz that I decided to go and study. He said, you know, I said, I guess you're going to study music, he said. He said, no, I'm going to study engineering. Engineering? For engineering, you're going to leave the kibbutz? He said, <laughs> it was unheard of. Unheard. Yeah. Now, how how are your parents encouraging this decision or discouraging? My parents were good enough to go along with anything okay. that I decided to do. So now you're in engineering school, which is um, Technion. Technion, which is a, a very good it, engineering. It's school. a good engineering school. I didn't know it at the time, but looking backward now, I mm -hmm. think I had the same experience. My teachers there were just superb. We are giants in science, mm. giants in education, and um, <clears throat> we are dedicated. I'm waiting for the next moment you take fire, or maybe the first moment when you, you see, maybe it's in engineering college, maybe after, a direction for your mind, for your... Where will you invest yourself? Uh, right now you are studying to be an engineer, <coughs> any particular kind of engineering? Electrical engineering. Okay. Electrical engineering. Okay. I decided to go to electronic. We call it uh, low current at the time. Electronic engineering because they told me it has more math, and okay. I wanted to utilize what I could was right. good at. 
So I went to um, electronic engineering. I didn't have any orientation. The stuff that I wanted to do was passé at the time already, but it interests me anyhow. Mm-hmm. And um, again, I wasn't uh, brilliant. I was always the fourth in class. Mm-hmm. I couldn't compete with those students who knew already what kind of questions would be asked in the exam. I didn't know them. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, eventually I graduated. Um, and what I should say is I liked what I studied. I liked it because I, I, I participated in the discovery of the things that I studied. And that because I had a teacher that was, or have been several teachers, that were really part of the discovery. Mm. Like Professor Ollendorf, who was one of the great um, um, electron microscope developer. And so <clears throat> I felt that I'm part of that. And they gave us the illusion that each one of us would make a discovery. Even the high school. Mm. Even in high school, I got this illusion that they keep on dreaming into us. Each one of you can discover another proof of Pythagoras theory. Yes. Okay? Yeah. What year is this now that you are I'm about to graduate? I'm talking about the, the 1966, I finished the army, yes. and I went to college. Okay. Yeah. Now, what is your next step going to be? As next step is, for me, it was clear. I'm going to go to graduate school. Okay. For that. So you're now committed to <coughs> developing this this knowledge in yourself. Only because it's a way of all flesh. Just because, because I really wanted to. Uh, <coughs> you study a little, enjoying it, and you want to develop it. So you go to where other people go. They mean to graduate school. To some, get people, some people decide it's enough education, I'm now going to make some money. Yeah, I was close to that, except uh, jobs in Israel at that time were not <laughs> bright, and job opportunities. Uh, so <laughs> instead of being a clerk in the, off, in the uh, postal office, <laughs> I decided to go to get my master's in Brooklyn Poly. Okay, so now you're going to leave Israel. I'm going to leave Israel. I'm, I got married first. Oh, yeah. I, okay. I met my wife also in college. In she college. was in the same class. And um, And at the time, did this seem like a, a radical decision to go on across, to leave the country, uh, to do graduate no, work? No, it was natural. natural. It it's was a, natural. Okay. You get good grades, you go and get your master and uh, PhD maybe. But the plan was to spend one year or maybe a few years to get a PhD, another year to become a millionaire, and then you come back. Okay, that was the plan. <laughs> that was the plan. Now the plan <laughs> went awry, maybe in a positive way. I, I, I accomplished the first goal. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. But you never return. I mean, not full no, time. Yeah, because I'm still waiting for the second. <laughs> <laughs> what happened in uh, Brooklyn in terms of your intellectual career? Um, in Brooklyn Poly, I uh, was my first encounter to American education, mm-hmm. and then I discovered that I am damn good. Ah. I mean, I compared myself to other students. That's okay. And give me maybe I can something I can offer something. Okay. And also I, I <laughs> we were very poor here when we came. Yes. We had meals in the automat uh, for twenty nine cents a day, <laughs> no more. And um, so I was thinking about invention. I'll invent something. I'll patent it, and I'll become. I'll accomplish the second goal. You know, mm-hmm. invention, invention. So I was thinking about invention. And my wife tells me that I was waking up at night and it was all kind of crazy idea. Um, one of the ideas I really appreciate it. I came up with the awareness that Maxwell was wrong in his equation. Yeah. The fourth equation is wrong. And I couldn't sleep all night until I woke up in the morning and he was right. <laughs> yeah. So that was my mood at the time. Yes. Right? 
What else can I tell you? Well, I, I need to make you a world-class uh, scientist soon. So I need to get you there. So how do I get you from the the Brooklyn student who finds he's pretty good, who starts being interested in the idea of innovation of some sort, yes, to somebody who pretty soon is going to do some groundbreaking... Oh, yeah, I'll tell you what. When I look back and people ask yes. me for this kind of question, yes. I look back and I say there were those sparks of... Audacity. Okay. As I can see sparks here and sparks oh. there. <laughs> One spark. I, I got a job in RCA laboratory. And I remember that uh, my work was, I invented something, and I got an invitation to speak in the American Physics Society in Cleveland. It was my first conference. So I just said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to them. And all the senior guys in RCA laboratory asked me, aren't you excited? Or aren't you uh, have a stage fright? Uh, you know, I said, <laughs> and they said, do you know what it means it's to be invited to give a talk? In the <laughs> I said, come on, guys. I'm going to tell those physicists something they don't know. And I should have a stage fright? <laughs> Where did I get it? I don't know. But it's been a factor in your life, this attitude. Yes, I think so, yes. And You're uh, not somebody who automatically salutes orthodoxy. Um, no, the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> the other way around. So where did I get this audacity to speak in front of uh, leaders Mm -hmm. of the field or other fields mm -hmm. and uh, tell them what they should do, how they should do things better. Right. I think I got it from the fact that I grew up in Bnei Brak. Mm -hmm. You know, I, <coughs> I drove the bus, the first bus that was connected between my town to Tel Aviv. And I, uh, my uncle was the first one who brought a water pump to the town. And uh, I went to a high school who was established, that was established at one year before I registered. Right. Okay. Everything was new. Yes. And my family and my neighbors and all the people of the town knew whatever they don't do for themselves, no one will do, do for, for them. them. And they didn't have expertise. There was no authority, there was no expertise to guide you. You have to innovate yourself. Right. And they knew that, but the shape that they, the way that they shape their life and their town is going to be the shape of the next generation and the country. So, so we know now that you are, in your own mind, capable of thinking in new ways, not over listening to people who tell you yes and no, but you still have to develop a career. Do you stay in the labs? Do you then go on to more graduate work? How do you? I stayed in action? the. I, I had a good arrangement where the, I could work on my thesis in the RCA laboratory. Really. And uh, now here I'll show you a case of audacity. I don't want to brag, but it's unheard of. I went to uh, Brooklyn Poly. No, 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 just for one month. And then somebody found a cheaper college for me, New York College of Engineering, so I went there. And then I visited my uncle in the hospital, and he told me, where are you going, Brooklyn, uh, Rutgers University? They're not too good in engineering. Why don't you, why don't you switch to Brooklyn Poly? They're good. And I said, okay, I'll try. So I went to Brooklyn Poly and I said, oh, what does it take to come and to graduate from your school? He said, well, I have to take classes and all the other. I said, no way. I'm going to give you the privilege of having me as your student. You actually use this word? Yes. These words. Why? Because I can offer you something you don't have. I worked in RCA laboratories. We have equipment you don't, don't think about. It, okay? So... Would you like me to be your student? Okay. I offer you, I'll, I'll, I would like to start doing my thesis without taking any classes. <laughs> you say, I don't know. You got to take some classes. 
I said, no, I'll pass the exam. I said, no one passed the exam without classes. I said, let me try. Okay. It turns out I, I passed the exam and I asked them, how did they do it? I said, flying color. I came home and said, what is flying? What is <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> Anyhow. And you found out it was good. I found out it was good. <laughs> and they gave me a PhD without taking any classes. My God. Just doing my, doing my thesis in RCA laboratory and defending it. And I did defend it, apparently. Well. So now defend it for me. What is the, the subject of your thesis? Oh, it was great. That was superconductivity. Okay. Superconductivity, yeah. We worked on superconductive memories. Right. Because magnetic cores were getting too slow and too bulky and you need to string them. If you make it on superconducting sheets and you put permanent currents one way or the other, you have a bit of one or zero, you get yourself a good memory and fast. So everybody at that time worked on superconductive memories in IBM, Bell Lab, and RCA laboratories. And that's what my thesis is about. So for the time, it was, it was answering a need of the time. It was in responsive to the science of the day. Correct. Right. It, yeah, it was a technological need to find a new phenomena in physics that could serve as a memory, as a basis for memory, for computer memory. It was before the semiconductors. Right, yeah. which wipes away all your expertise. All my you know, expertise, correctly. So when did the semiconductor... I should tell, also oh, yeah. tell you, just Please. to fit in something which... Do you know that there is a vortex named after me? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Because of the thesis. I'm immortal. Yeah. Before the thesis, yeah. It turns out that my thesis, I investigated a new type of vortex in, in film that only 20 or 30 years later, a physicist started looking at it. And they looked, they found my thesis, they call it Pearl Vortex. Wow. You can even Google it, okay? So now I have a star on my name there yeah, in yeah. the galaxy. I'm immortal. <laughs> but, your, but your expertise is still going to be wiped out by semiconductors. Yes. The technology of superconductor memory was wiped up completely. Uh, I went to, that was... Uh, yeah, three years after. Oh, later, of course. Yeah, after I worked for three years on the um, plated wire memory, magnetic, the semiconductor just wiped everything up. Yeah. So it's a new world. It's uh, a new world. I was working here in California in a, a company named Electronic Memories. Okay. And the day came where they told me, no jobs. <laughs> okay. Luckily, I had a friend in UCLA, or a relative, that I kept a phone number, so I called him, and Jerry Estrin was his name, and I said, hey, look, I was really uh, audacious. <laughs> Not here at UCLA, but I went to USC first. Now when I talk to you, I look back and say, well, where did I get this chutzpah? Right. <laughs> no, I wanted to go to computer software. Okay. Um, why? Don't ask me why. Because it's tricky, you know. You program things and they do things as yes, you want them. So I went to USC and I tried to interest the dean in high anyway. So he said, what did you do in software? I said, nothing. But I know I can do well. I said, i crazy. He said, he asked me, I have heard people who spent 30 years of their career doing software. And you want me to hire you, and you've done even a single program? I said, yes, I can prove myself. I prove myself wherever I go. I don't know where I got it. Today, I wouldn't say that. No. I, I, it just... Uh, but it worked. It worked. It, okay. it's so not a, no, he didn't hire me at you. Oh, he didn't hire you. No. He and kicked you out of the office. He kicked me out of the <laughs> office, yeah. So yes. then you came to UCLA. UCLA, they said, let's, I think we have a slot. I didn't know what the slot is. <laughs> but he said, um, come over. And the next day I was working here at UCLA in the lab. And, and then eventually they wanted me to teach. Hmm. And I started teaching 
and the higher we... What were you teaching? What was the direction? Now? Well, in computer science, I started teaching uh, hardware. Okay. Computer memories, um, programming, yes, things which I didn't do before. But, uh, so, I, at the time, now what year is this? It was exactly the beginning of 1970. Okay. So look around with me at the time of computers in 1970 and tell me what the situation is now. Uh, well, I, we I was still had the dream of getting into software. Okay. And um, it didn't materialize because I moved to the different department. Department of Engineering Systems, but so sort of interdisciplinary, and uh, everybody working on a different uh, uh, aspect of life and science, and uh, they asked me to teach decision theory, and that was a good experience. Mm. I quit computers, and I started teaching statistics, decision theory. Uh, what is it? probability theory? Yeah. It was a good education for me. Is this, uh, and remember I'm a layman, so I may not ask this the right way, yeah. is this statistical logic that you are entering into as a, as a discipline at this point? You can call it statistical logic, because I don't know of any other statistical logic. <laughs> yeah, we had to make decisions, optimal decisions. Right. Right. Okay, what, uh, how to deal with uncertainty. Right. How to deal the with it. strategies that uh, statisticians developed <clears throat> in terms of optimizing uh, actions under uncertainty from books like uh, Savage, from Foundation of Statistics, from books like Rafer and Schleifer, uh, Ferguson was influential. So I read all these statistical decision theories books and I taught it. And I liked it because, you know, it had a philosophical part to it. Ah. Yeah. It has to deal with scientific methods. You act in the world. The world gives you some information. You have to utilize the information as to its maximum degree. And uh, you have to decide what is relevant and what is not relevant and make a right decision. So it <clears throat> for me it represented the philosophy of science, mm. now, cast in statistical terms. Now you're going to fold this back into computer theory quite soon, uh, or not? How long? Not it yet. It took me a few years before I was rehired by computer science into into computer science. So maybe mid seventies. It was yeah mid mid seventies. Okay. I started teaching. I continued teaching decision theory to computer science, but I dressed it up in artificial intelligence. Ah. Okay. Yes. Because artificial intelligence at that time began to worry about uncertainty. And um, I think the statist statistical decision theory was the only neat or formal way of addressing it. And um, so I taught uh, decision theory to computer scientists under the cloak of artificial intelligence. Of course, I also taught uh, elementary artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which was search theory, game playing, heuristics. And um, I married the two. My first book was about heuristics. Yes, the rules of thumb. Because many people watching this will be at an early stage in their career. I'm just wondering, you, you're still a young scientist in this. Uh, you are looking around in the world. Are you beginning to construct questions that you want to answer? Yeah, but this was still the question that... Uh, Bother me today. Okay, tell me what they are. <laughs> well, how do we manage to to do so well in a foreign environment? Our, we, our, we human beings. We human beings, yes. 
the world is full of uncertainty. We, the amount of information that we have about the world is minuscule. And despite all this uh, missing information, we do so well with rules of thumb, with heuristics. Yes. And the embodiment of heuristic was in gameplay, okay? chess playing, <laughs> go. All those uh, games require that you look ahead, you assign a dirty evaluation function at the horizon, mm -hmm. and you roll it back, and then you decide your best move, which is a metaphor for thinking f until today. It's a very powerful metaphor to the way we think. So in the process of thinking about machines at this point, and artificial intelligence being very generally spoken of as the attempt of machines to make machines think the way we do as human beings, um, people are expecting a great deal of machines at this point. What, what is the hope for machine? Is the term machine learning used yet? Just beginning. Just beginning. There was only, I think, one paper by Samuel about machine learning, checker. Uh, his idea was you're playing the machine with this uh, function that evaluates the board strength. And uh, it's a dirty function because not accurate, uh, but you learn it. Mm. So you look at the several moves, and I think he used um, linear regression and he adjusted the coefficient very much like they do today with the deep learning. Mm. He adjusted the coefficients of the attributes which make up that function and optimize it so they can play better. Mm. So I still have his original paper here. Wow. <laughs> so what role are you going to play in this quest at uh, this stage in your life? The role of analyzing, an anal analysis. Uh, what makes one heuristic better than another? Okay. What, what, how sensitive is the um, effectiveness of your game, the probability that you make the right move to the sloppiness of the heuristic? And uh, these, are, these were all mathematical results about, about a game-playing uh, endeavor that most AI people at the time were investigating. Mm. But most AI people dealt with it not mathematically, and I tried to introduce mathematics to that um, dirty game. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you are very much of a movement that wants to mathematize the scruffy, right. uh, and you achieved this. I mean, you, yes, I, in certain area, I made some results. I'm proud of. Well, please be proud in front of me. <laughs> Tell me what the the breakthrough was well, in, for you in the machine learning. Oh no, in the game playing, I could point out one or two breakthroughs. One of them is the uh, automatic learning of uh, heuristics. And the idea was that heuristic is just uh, uh, simplifier. You make simplifying assumptions about the world, and you find the optimal strategy under those simplified assumptions. The strategy that you find under the simplification becomes in the strategy, it becomes your heuristics. And this happened to be very, lent itself very well to autom automation. So people in planning are doing it now. They're still using this so, idea that heuristic is nothing else but optimization under simplifying assumptions. Now, is the machine now of the future that people are developing a servant of hu the human will? What is, what is the notion of where machines will fit into um, the process of human thinking? I think at that time people thought that if they get a good machine playing program, then they solve a huge part of human intelligence. Really? Yes. Because they saw human intelligence 
in what you would might now call a very limited way. Yes, correct. Yes. At that time, it was big. Mach- machine playing was a, a huge chunk of AI at the time. And yeah. at this if you look point, at the textbook, the textbook was totally uh, game playing. And you too believe this. I mean, you are participating in this yes. intellectual moment. Correct, yes. So maybe it's crazy to jump so fast, but it seems to me as I read your work and so forth that your leap is from thinking about intelligence in this way to intuition, which is not intelligence. I mean, not only intelligence. Well, intuition played a role in machine, in, in the game playing. Ah, so yeah. you're already dealing with intuition. Oh, I'm dealing too. with intuition, yes. Okay. The intuition that a chess master would have looking at the board and say how strong it is. Or what makes one move stronger than another. Yes. You have intuition. Just look at the board and say, mm, it's a stupid move. Mm, it's a good move. Yeah. And that intuition we wanted to capture in in machine. Yeah. Yeah. And are you successful in doing this? This is a, a stage. Um, I don't think there was then a breakthrough in machine playing like we have today with ah. AlphaGo. No. Okay. Technology was not there, and the... Uh, Maybe the memory? I mean. Memory was also, yeah. It was a big uh, li- limitation, resource limitation, yeah, in memory. Time, of course, search time. But then I moved to, to totally to, uh, because expert system came on board. Yes. And that was a shift in the emphasis in the machine uh, intelligence. And people were just automating doctors and uh, mineral explorers and not doing any more. And we had customers. Machine playing didn't have many customers. But um, expert system had. Which is the replication of how, in a profession, an expert yes. field, you go about making, um, developing insights. Is that essentially what expert systems are? Expert system is a system that emulates, emulates. the professional. Right. A chemist, how a chemist might a chemist or proceed or whatever the field is. A physician is. is the best example. How a physician distinguishes between symptoms that indicate malaria from those that indicate the flu. Okay. That's a, it's a process that the idea was we want to emulate the doctor or assist the doctor in advice, but uh, we are going to save a tremendous amount of time, of money, because those professionals are being paid. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, so the game was to replace the highly paid professionals. And, uh, and you're, you're in that game? I no, mean, no, no, I heard about this game. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, the, and the dilemma was, how do you represent uncertainty? Because in all these professions you have uncertainty, and the, the technology was elicit from the doctor or the professional right. his method of reasoning, rules that guide him in his professional, in his professional life. Yes. Like you see a symptoms, symptom A, and then you feel that there is a hunch that you have malaria with a certain certainty factor, let's say, in that you're highly likely to have malaria, right. but then you have another symptom which makes you highly likely to have flu, and you combine them together, and you come up with a, uh, another certainty factor that you may have just ordinary headache. Right. Okay. So uh, the physician had, had used to, had to uh, int- be interviewed, like I'm being interviewed mm-hmm. now, and reveal the way he thinks about all these rules that uh, drive him, that uh, guide him in his professional life. And and a programmer would sit next to the professional, write down all the rules, and program them, and emulate it on a computer. And then there would be some conversation between the professional. No, I wouldn't do that. At this point, I will change my mind. But 
you told us that you're going to use, you're do, yes. using this rule and that rule. It's not that thing coincide with what you're saying now. Well, I changed the rule. So, and there would be back and forth. Eventually, you'll have an expert system, system which emulates a professional to a certain degree. Because, of course, I've read something about your work as it has proceeded to this day. So I'm going to echo what I think your sense of stages are and say that this is the stage in uh, the causal ladder of observation, that this is noticing and seeing but not... Yes, that was, uh, at that time they wanted to predict in or to diagnose. Diagnosis was the main thing. Okay. You are facing with a bunch of observations right. and you got to decide if what the chances are that you find oil in this field. Right. So you are translating the collection of observation to a belief in a certain proposition. Right. That was the name of the game. And at that point, I noticed that people are not doing it uh, formally. Uh, the, uh, and I said, we should do it correctly. <laughs> what is correctly? Well, what, whenever you hear a scientist say, let's do it correctly, it means that it matches his background. His own <laughs> assumption. His yes. prejudice. Right, his prejudice. <laughs> My prejudice was statistics and decision theory and uh, probability theory, because this is what I taught in uh, college in the 1970s. Right. So let's do it correctly. And I noticed that we cannot do it correctly because the memory space requirement are exponentially exploding. And same thing with the time that we take if we do it traditionally. Traditionally means to build a table of probability and then manipulate it. Uh, so I decided, decided, I simplified things, and I thought, what would be the kind of architecture that would enable us to overcome those memory, exponential memory, exponential time requirement? And I thought that uh, at that time that we should learn really from the way humans do it. And of course, we don't have exponential time, exponential memory here. And I read a paper by Rummelhart. And Rummelhart had a, in 1976 mm -hmm. a, paper, a paper about how children read text. And he postulated that they are doing handshaking, that there is a handshaking architecture there between the semantic level, the pixel level, the letter level, the word level and the sentence level, mm -hmm. and they all collaborate and pass messages to each other, and eventually the system, after passing messages, relaxes to the decision, I'm reading the cat. Or oh, the word is car, not cat, okay? Depending on the context, whichever. And that was very appealing to me. And if, it, if a ch five year old child can do it, and obviously a computer can do it, right? Mm -hmm. So let's think about an architect that will give you the correct results restricted by this message passing architecture. Mm -hmm. and I found one, a mm -hmm. tree, if you have a tree and you pass messages, then eventually things relax to the correct probability. Mm -hmm. I was very happy with that. I was very happy, and I <coughs> even published a paper on saying... Is this the origin of the prob probabilistic? <coughs> yeah, that paper was named Reverend Bayes on Inference Engine. Okay. Inference Engine was a name he used for the expert system. I see. But everybody d discounted probability. They had we came to ill repute because of the exponential demands. And so I published this paper, um, how to do what pr with probabilities what people say you can't. So you're challenging again in your audacious way 
the general assumptions. The general assumptions. And I simply felt that we should do it, number one, correct, and number two, efficiently. And marry, to, marry the two if possible. And uh, it came up with the belief propagation system. And in 1985, mm -hmm. I even coined the name Bayesian Network. And uh, well, then, uh, and it's received well. I mean, oh, people yeah. do listen to this. Not new yet, not yet. Not yet. Yeah, it was received well among um, statisticians, but not in the AI community. Not in the AI community. No, among statisticians, it was a group from uh, Denmark, uh, Lauritsen and his company. Um, they, they built extra system, a uh, medical diagnosis system, based on, based on these. these ideas, and um, but then I made a audacious step, another one. Okay. <laughs> but the book, I gave a homework. We couldn't deal with loops. Trees and poly trees were okay. But with loops, we had a problem because we had a, a pro belief propagation, messages propagating constantly, repeating itself, not con sometimes converging to the right uh, answer. So I, I gave it a homework to students, find out the effectiveness of this approximation scheme with message are passing from one node to another as if they were situated in a polytree, forgetting the fact that they are really residing in a loopy network. Mm. Okay. See what's happening. It was a, a slip of the tongue that made Bayesian network work. <laughs> mm. Of course, no students could solve it. Right. But people who noticed it uh, tried it. <laughs> it worked and beautiful. It worked. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, repeat, because I think you've said a bit of this, how, why the artificial intelligence community is resisting this, and what, at what point do they begin to embrace it as an idea? They resisted it because, first of all, because of the bad reputation that probability had. Yes. And second, because because there was, it was in the middle of the tension between the Scruffies and the Neetis. The Neetis wanted to understand what they are doing, uh, or to have it, at least uh, some formal element to it, so they can govern, have a guarantee of performance. Yeah. And the Scruffies said, let's build a system that works. Yes. And as long as it is works, it's good enough for us. Yes. We have a similar situation today. <laughs> yeah. yes. But, uh, so, the Nittis were not in uh, command, the Scruffies were. Oh. That was the reason, I think, that if, at first, Bayesian networks were not um, received well. But then, with the success of the belief propagation system. Okay, explain, yeah. explain that success. People could, uh, it was easy to program. Okay. All you had to program is what message one node sent to the other. It was asynchronous. You didn't have to tell when the messages are being sent. Yes. Wake up in the middle of the night, look at your neighbor, send them a message. Whenever they wake up, they'll do the same. Right. And it's very easy to program. It's, if it converges, you're lucky. Most of the time it does converge to the right answer. It was a boom. Everybody could program it, and it was transparent. Because the way that the, the network was arranged matched your causal understanding of the world. So, and that made a big difference. As opposed to the expert system, it was rule-based. Here could, people could program diagnosis of a car, car engine, the way they understand that the car works. 
using a mapping of the compon individual components of the cars, which component affect another, and so forth. It was a ter terrific advantage to be able to redo things when a new when a new car engine comes in. You didn't have to change the entire system. You only had to have to change the module that was novel. That reconfiguration ability made the difference between made people who want to use beige network uh, for expert system. So, so are you, at this point now, intellectually, you're now at peace with, or they are at peace with you, the artificial intelligence community. I mean, they, they have accepted these principles, essentially. Yes, essentially, uh, uh, Bayesian Network made me famous okay. in the, or at least known, yes. in the uh, artificial intelligence community. Right. Correct. So clearly a man of your nature is not going to be happy being accepted uh, by the Orthodox community, so... How no, the then? moment they, it became commercial, I left them. Yes. <laughs> I could predict this. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, because, because I realized something. Yes. I realized the reason for this reconfigurability feature and this explainability feature. It was that all the Bayesian network, even though it wasn't causal, yes. we call it probabilistic, it was matching our causal intuition about the world. Mm -hmm. And that we didn't realize that yes. that was the power of it. So the causal element was really responsible for lots of the acceptability of Bayesian network. So when I realized that causality is not really, it's uh, the third dimension. Yes. It, to understand causality, you have to go to a dimension above probability, that probabilities could not capture causality. Mm -hmm. I shifted to study causality. So is this now the next stage of the exploration of causation and machines. I think at that point I published a book okay. uh, about Bayesian network. Uh, it's a very successful. It was a very successful book. It was called Probabilistic Reasoning, <clears throat> and uh, it was published in 1988. And um, at that point I felt like an apostate of it, that what I say in my book. Yes, yeah. from prophet to apostate. Yes, because I realized already that my love was with another girl, yes. namely with, pro with causality, and that probability cannot capture causality, that ah. we have to go to another dimension altogether. Altogether. Yeah. What is that dimension of thinking? Explain it to me. Now, we've, we've left probability at the dance. You're now embracing causation, but yes. at another level. What is this new level? A new level is a level of uh, causal, uh, first of all, causal assumption, I call it. Okay, causal assumption. Which means that correlation is not causation, as we all know, but it's much more profound than that. It's, it means that you need to have causal assumptions before you get causal conclusions. Ah. You cannot get causal conclusions from correlation alone, from observation alone, no matter how you manipulate the observation, no matter how smart you are in look at them from one angle to another, manipulate them, if you don't have intervention, it's physically, That's or, or assumptions. About hypothetical intervention or assumption about how the world works from a causal perspective, you cannot get a causal uh, conclusion. It was a clash of language, a class of computer languages, if you want. The computer level of language required for 
statistical analysis requires another component, and this is causal assumption. So you say, I'll accept causal assumption. Good. And I'll, I'll do causal reasoning with causal assumption. You can't. You can't. Because you need to express that assumption formally. In what language? We don't have a computer language for that. Oh. And then I discovered that we don't have this language for this essential component of human intelligence. You look at science, and you say, there's no language to say the rooster crow doesn't cause the sun to rise. Right. It just correlates with that. You can say it correlates, but that's not the same. Yes. You and I know. It does not cause the sun. The rooster it crow does, does correlate. Does not cause the sun to come. Even precede and correlates, but it doesn't cause it. Right. So just to say, I'm not saying to prove it. Yes. I'm just to say that sentence no requires a formal language. Yes. And that language, can, it doesn't exist in the statistical um, arena. It must be something extra statistical. Yes. Once you realize that, you say, what is it? Okay. Well. <clears throat> is this where we are now? In we are now, era? yes, in 1988, the year that I left probabilistic reasoning. And I went to causal reasoning, enticed by that challenge. Yeah, indeed. Linguistic challenge. Okay. Yes. And I found that there is a language like that. Ah. It was done by Sewell uh, Wright, a geneticist, in 1920. It's called Causal Diagram. He just, he wanted to say that the rooster crow doesn't cause the sun to rise. Don't put an arrow between, put a diagram, and don't put an arrow between the rooster crow and the sun to rise. As though it was leading to that. Yes. Arrow means that it has a causal power. Yes. Not having arrow means it's causally it's irrelevant. Okay. So using these arrows, you can um, augment the data and uh, augment it with these causal assumptions that are so badly needed. Yes. Okay. So now we are in the business of marrying qualitative language of diagrams with sophisticated uh, data and statistical analysis on data, marrying the two because you don't want to leave the, the qualitative diagrammatic assumptions on their own. You, you want to combine the with data and get quantitative estimates to what degree does A cause B, what degree um, one disease causes symptoms, or one treatment cures cancer. Okay. These are complicated yes. domains. Yes. We cannot, but it turns out that you need only qualitative model conceptual correlative who causes whom right. and that is enough for you to combine it with data and get the answer you so, you uh, as we come to the end of this you've come out with a, a resounding call for understanding this in the book of why yes uh, just came out I think very very recently it just came out this month and is this basically a, a call to the AI community to redirect their their in, their energy, their philosophy, their hopes for the machine? I mean, what what are you asking? In the it's book a call that? for several communities. Okay. Uh, the machine learning community is one of them because the machine learning techniques that are being pursued today were all statistical mode, in statistical mode. Still. Okay. Which I call not derogatory, but I, I, I want to, I, I use the term curve fitting. Not in a derogatory sense, but in, in order to transfer the idea. In the same way that you pass a curve through a bunch of points, okay, this is all is what is done in machine learning. 
in the sense that you don't supplement it with any information which is not in the data. Yes. You simply restrict yourself to the information that the data can supply you, and you're trying to manipulate the data by fitting very good function, complex function, with hills and valleys. Right. Crazy function. So the machine yeah. learning community needs to hear your message. Yes. Who's, what other community? You, you said there were... The island of resistance. Okay. <laughs> okay. There are islands of resistance in economics, in statistics, so, but do not believe in graphs. And they believe in a different... Uh, first of all, they don't even know about causality. Most statisticians do not know how to handle cause-effect relationship because most statisticians are hooked, are enchanted by the same siren songs as the machine learning people. Let's get it all from the data, okay? They trust the data alone to provide the answers. Yeah, for two reasons. Machine learning people, because the data, it's beautiful. You yeah. don't have to think. You don't right. have to the data, it's in the data. Yeah. And the statisticians are doing it for another reason. They don't have any other language. Yeah. All they learned is to summarize data. I know that when statisticians will listen to me, they say, no, 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 I'm worried about code. Yes, they're all worried about it, informally. It's true. <laughs> Because who, who else will employ a statistician? Who cares about data? They care about the effect of treatment. Yes. Okay? So they hire a statistician to decide cause-effect relationship. The statistician says, I'm sorry, all I can give you uh, are associations. Okay, and somehow they manage the salary, yes. <laughs> even though there is a cheating here. Okay? Right. And because statisticians is bound by the language he or she learned in um, grad school. And the language of statistics is void of causal relationship. You can take any statistic textbook and search for cause or causality in the index and you will find none. Okay. And so that has led the artificial inquiry in the wrong direction in terms of getting replication of human thinking. Not only, yeah, but the physicians are not worried about human thinking. They are worried about getting the drugs correctly. Okay. Uh, approving the right drugs, okay? But those who, are, who want the machine to approximate human thinking are still not thinking in causal terms. Correct. <clears throat> they are thinking in terms of um, uh, fi data. Fitting, fitting data. Fitting, fitting data and extracting as much information as you can from the data. Thank you. It's the beginning of the conversation, but we end it now. Thank you.